Welcome to The American Veteran, a news magazine produced by the Department of Veteran Affairs. I'm Henry Huntley, an Army veteran. And I'm Melissa Heinz of the Air National Guard. We're at the Defense Media Activity Studios in Fort Meade to bring you the latest news from VA, as well as inspiring stories of your fellow veterans. All of these stories and more can be found online at VA's blog, Vantage Point. Check us out at blogs.va.gov. Last year, while on a comedy tour, comedian and Navy veteran Rodney Perry suffered a severe stroke. Rodney received life-saving care at the Denver VA Medical Center and spent the next 40 days in their inpatient rehabilitation clinic. Here's more on Rodney's road to recovery. I was a year ago today, I was here in Denver, September 30th, last year, I had a stroke. So the fact that I'm standing here before you ain't nothing but God, y'all, really. Now that I look back on it, I was kind of not feeling well leading up to Denver. And I was talking to one of my buddies on the phone, and he was telling me about a, a friend of ours that had had a stroke. And as he was telling me her story, I was like, yo, I feel like that now. And so he was like, dude, you need to go get your blood pressure checked, like, right now. I was 221 over 140, and I felt like I was in trouble. You know, I was like, yo, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not good. But this is why the story gets really stupid. <laughs> so I still go to the club and do two shows that night. Mr. Perry, please, <laughs> go to sleep. He was having a hard time holding the microphone. And that's when I really got alarmed. And uh, he was also alarmed, too. He knew he wasn't functioning properly. I did the two shows, and, I, and my brother, who lives in Denver, and he was feature act for me that night, he took me to the uh, VA. They brought me in. I thought they would lower my pressure, and I would go home, to be honest. I basically had the stroke at the hospital. He, he stayed and didn't walk again until he was able to be trained to. That was a... Uh, it's a culmination of life. I say that because there is nothing I can question anymore. I saw him. There were moments where I thought, well, I, well, I'll never stand again. When you can't use your left hand, you don't, you don't even think about the fact that you can't take care of yourself. He's an animated performer. Rodney would dive across the stage and everything in a full suit. And, and I've watched him do that. So to watch him walk in, and not be able to walk, and moreover than that, not know you don't know how to walk yet. And the next thing I heard was like, yeah, he's in the hospital, he's at the VA, and I was like, good. And then in my mind, I was like, I really hope that they keep him and they get him right, because I know he'll be like, I gotta go, I got these shows to do. Yeah, you give yourself a hug. Cross your chest. Yeah. When he came in, he definitely had deficits in multiple areas as far as uh, after his stroke. So not only did it affect his physical, it also affected a little bit of his ability to process information that he was receiving. So their questions were, was, is he going to get back to work? And I'll be honest, our initial presentation, I was not sure that he was going to get back to work. Well, no, I'm in rehab. It's, it's speech therapy, it's, it's physical therapy, it's occupational therapy. You're in a hospital, you have a wheelchair, you can't walk, and you're a stand-up comedian. You're a stand-up comedian. You need to stand. That's kind of part of the job. Keep using that left hand as much as you can. This is the secret. That's the secret. You got it. It actually works, but you just got to tell it to do something. It does. And one thing that, as I communicate to them, is I need to be able to stand on stage. She's like, well, why don't we make that a part of your therapy? Take your time. Think out what you're doing. Yep, take your time. His biggest goal, of course, was being able to get back on stage and and be able to do it halfway decently. When we first started with them, it was just working on standing and then stepping in the parallel bars. We YouTube videos of his prior performances to see how he used to do his performances on stage. That way we knew functionally what we had to get him ready for. Okay, let's do two more laps before you take a rest if you can. Take your time. A lot of what he does is quick, rapid action on his feet and being able to analyze an audience and determine whether he's going down the right road or not or if he needs to switch gears. You know how. Down to earth. Down to earth. There's so many human beings that are part of this process. The lady that was so patient, and she said, just, just grab the salt shaker and put it on top. And it was so hard. It was so hard.
I didn't think I, didn't think I was going to be able to do it again. Just, you know, it was moments when I was like, yo, I can't do this. I wanted to give up. But I, I couldn't. With Rodney, it was pretty unique because stand-up comedy, there are no tools that we could give him to work other than standing in front of us and, and telling his jokes and, and performing. So that was what we did. I can't wait to get on that stage. I mean, we got some stuff, some hospital jokes, got some new stroke material. I'm going to be the stroke comic. This was the big test for me. Everyone was like, oh, he's walking around and, you know, he's able to communicate and everything. I know him. So this is a big test to watch him get excited about it, you know. <laughs> he put his hat on and everything. And those are things that let me know Rodney's back. <laughs> How do you not tell a guy like Rodney Ray, you are not going to make a show on the 18th? I was not sure if I could conquer that. And so to have that show in the conference room. I mean, I couldn't walk kind of gave me a light. Once he got those laughs, I'm back. And I'm never going to let anything take that away from me again. Yeah, that's what I felt from Rodney that day. Right. You know, I, was, I, was, I was reasonably funny. And scale of 1 to 10, I might have been a, you know, a stroke 10, but a regular maybe 4 or 5. <laughs> <laughs> let me tell you something. You do not respect medical people to your ass in the To stand on stage and tell people, about my stroke and about what I went through is, is maybe the realest piece of comedy that I've done in, in over a decade. A team in the hospital, thirsty as hell, and needs some ice chips. <laughs> Yo, it's boy Roddy Perry. About to head home. Had a stroke one month ago. The people that were at the VA that not only helped me, but helped me in such a way where they allowed me to keep my dignity. That's the most powerful part for me. For more information on VA health care or to hear more stories from veterans like Rodney, visit our blog Vantage Point at blogs.va.gov. Secretary David Shulkin is leading VA through a transformation to better serve our nation's veterans. I had the chance to sit down with him to learn more about his plans to modernize VA. Secretary Shulkin, we first spoke eight months ago when you were just days into your term as Secretary of VA, but give us an update. What are some of the things you have been focusing on during your time as Secretary? Well, there's been a lot of activity and we're working on many things, but it's all about modernizing the VA, making the VA a place that veterans are proud to get their care and services in. So we've been focusing on five priorities, improving the timeliness of our services to make sure that veterans aren't waiting longer than they need to for their care and for their benefits. We've been focusing on improving our facilities and equipment. So we've announced a new electronic medical record we're going to be going to that's the same one that the Department of Defense uses. We have announced that we're going to be getting rid of vacant and underutilized buildings and investing more into our facilities. We also have announced that we're going to be focusing as a priority on foundational services, those things most important to veterans, where the VA needs to be there for our veterans and things like polytrauma, traumatic brain injury, PTSD, prosthetics, orthotics, rehabilitation services, mental health services. And we've also been prioritizing giving veterans greater choice. We're going to be working to improve our choice program so veterans are in control of their care. And finally, our fifth and final clinical priority is to reduce suicide among veterans. Speaking about choice, there are approximately 20 million veterans living in the United States and only about 9 million of them are choosing to come to VA. Why do you think veterans should choose to come to VA and are there specific things that you're looking at to help veterans make that choice? As the representative of the Department of Veteran Affairs, we represent all 20 million veterans and we recognize and honor their service and want to make sure that they're recognized for the contributions that they've given to the country. The nine million veterans that you referenced are those that use the VA healthcare system. And as you may or may not know, not everybody is eligible, but we certainly want everyone who is eligible for healthcare benefits to know about the VA and to choose the VA as a place to get their care because we believe that we provide a really extraordinary service. Are there any specific things that you're looking forward to in the future to help veterans make that choice coming to VA? 
Well, we want to be more veteran-centric. We want to essentially improve the quality of our service and let veterans know that we're there to be their advocates. All too often, VA has been seen in the past as adversarial. And while the vast majority of our employees go to work every day to honor our veterans and they're there because they believe and they're committed to that, uh, we have at times lost track of that the veterans are our customers. And so that's where we really want to focus. We do want veterans to choose VA as a place that provides them services and benefits. Since becoming secretary, you've been meeting with veterans all around the country and working on modernizing VA, but yet you still find time to see patients, and that's both in person and through telehealth. Why is this important to you? It helps keep me closer to the reality of what I'm trying to do as an executive or as a leader. And so when I take that time and I put on my white coat and I'm no longer the secretary, but I'm just the doctor taking care of a veteran, it helps me understand how our computer systems work, how easy it is to be able to access referrals or to order drugs. And I hear directly from veterans about the challenges that they have and the struggles that they have. And it reminds me of why I'm doing what I'm doing. And so uh, it's also one way for me to be able to continue to give back to veterans, which I think is so important for all of us to do. What can veterans look forward to coming from the VA? Well, I think that they're seeing a VA that's looking forward, that is pushing uh, to change, that we know that this has to be a transformed, modernized system if it's going to continue to serve veterans not only now, but for generations to come. And having a strong VA is essential to national security, that when you make a decision to send young men and women off in harm's way, that that's a commitment not only during the time that they're in that conflict, but it's a commitment for life when they come back home to be able to honor that commitment. And so for us to keep the VA to be the type of organization that we need, we need to be able to fix and to transform this organization and deal with some of the problems that have been there for decades that have spanned multiple administrations. It's now time to get serious about fixing those problems. Veterans Day is a time to reflect upon and honor the service and sacrifices that our men and women have made for our country. And it's VA's mission to do this every day, but I hear you guys are doing something a little different this year. Could you tell us what kind of message would you like to send to our veterans? November 11th is a very important day, not only for us at VA, but for all veterans and their families across the country, because it is that one particular day that we make sure that we do sit down and reflect upon what so many have contributed and so many who may not be with us today have contributed. But there's so much going on in the Department of Veteran Affairs that we wanted to expand it to be Veterans Month. And each day of the month we are planning on doing something special and making announcements or inviting people into their local VAs and open houses so they can come and revisit and get to talk to people about what's happening in their communities and in their VAs. We're going to be having other announcements like a national veterans ID card, something that veterans have been asking about for many, many years, and now it's going to become a reality and we're going to roll that out. And there are going to be other special announcements during the month uh, coming from both the White House and us here at the Department of Veteran Affairs. Do you have a message that you want to give to veterans on Veterans Day? Well, that we're extremely proud and we recognize that without their commitments that we wouldn't be here enjoying the freedoms that we all have as a country and how grateful and privileged we are here at the Department of Veteran Affairs to be able to give back just a little bit to those veterans by our services that we provide. As always, it's great to have you here on our show. Thanks Thank for coming you. by. Thank you and I appreciate the time that you spent so that we could get some of this information out to our veterans. For more of our interview with Secretary Shulkin or to learn more about VA's modernization, visit VantagePoint at blogs.va.gov. When we come back... I was in battle for six times. Marine Corps veteran Thomas Begay recalls his time in the top secret Navajo Code Talker program. The VA does a very good job on the medical side. I don't know of anybody that has any complaints. My primary care doctor is probably the best doctor I've ever had in my life. Louis, <laughs> my friend, good patient of mine. He only comes once a week, but I do. I enjoy him. She really comes enjoy. in special. It's yes, early I in the do. morning. Early in the Just morning. For me. That's exactly why I choose VA.
Boots to Business is an entrepreneurial training program offered by the U.S. Small Business Administration to support transitioning service members and veterans. Here's a look at one of their success stories. My name is Chandler Lyles and I'm one of the owners of Lyles Barbecue Company located in Lexington, Kentucky. Lyle's Barbecue is different than every other barbecue joint out there because not only do we have excellent service in a friendly environment, but we really focus on the food here. So that's everything from making the meats in an authentic, slow-smoked, southern way to all of our sides are made from scratch daily. Chandler kind of caught the bug from me and his mom doing barbecue on the weekends, and he learned a lot by our trial and error. And then when I separated and my dad and mom retired from the Air Force, we all moved back to Lexington. And we had always wanted to be business owners. We were looking for our own thing. So we decided to open up a little roadside barbecue stand. Transitioning out of the Air Force, Boost to Business gave us the foundational knowledge that we needed to understand how to manage budgets and cash flow and marketing inventory management, all those things, you know, allowed us to not make as many mistakes as we probably would have without the course. The great thing about the SBA is that they're a strategic partner in helping small businesses grow their business. In business, you've got to get into the trenches and really do the day-to-day -day stuff to see if you can make it, um, but you have a lot better chance of survival if you have a really strong foundation, and that's what a program like Boots to Business with the SBA did for us. Some of the best advice I could share with individuals getting ready to separate from service and they're thinking about starting a business, start trying to prove your concept now. See if someone will actually buy your product or service. Start as small and as narrow as you can in the beginning. It's gonna do two things for you. One, it's gonna to prove to yourself if you even wanna do that business with as little risk as possible. And the second thing is, the market's gonna tell you if your product's worth it or not. We started in a tent three years ago. In, in just this short amount of time, we built a business from nothing to over a million dollars in sales with almost no debt on it at all. If you're thinking about starting a family-owned and operated business, then the key is defining everyone's roles and understanding that you know there's somebody in charge or somebody that's going to be the ultimate decision maker. I am the ultimate decider. <laughs> not hardly. <laughs> Unfortunately, not ever. <laughs> I have to definitely listen to Chandler, which is kind of an odd uh, dynamic, but at the same time, you know, that's kind of our personalities. And the beautiful thing about our family is that everybody really brought something different to the table. My mom is the heart of the business. She does all the operations stuff day to day. All of our managers report to her, and she's really cultivating that environment of when you're eating here, you're eating at her house. My dad is a jack of all trades guy. Without him, our company wouldn't be to this point because he's saved us a ton of money doing maintenance. He has helped us do deliveries. And without that support and being able to bounce ideas off of him from my position of, hey, what do you think about doing this? What do you think about doing that? That's, that's invaluable, having that sort of experience come to the table. Uh, and then my role is the storyteller of the brand. My job is to give you a reason as a first time customer to connect with us and then get into the door. We've done almost zero advertising outside of social media. We've got a full-time video guy that does a ton of work for us. We take a ton of photos on our phones, making our product look good. We show our staff. You know, we're all about every day telling little stories so that it adds up over the course of time to a big story that your customers connect with. I wouldn't trade the hours spent cooking barbecue with my family on the weekends back in high school for anything. And then to be able to take that feeling and bring it to a larger audience every day at our actual restaurants is really what's made us successful. Running a business is like being on a roller coaster. You know, you know it's gonna be fun and you know it's gonna be awesome and then once you're on it, it's up and down and it's scary and then it's the best and then it's the worst and it's really all over the place. But by the time 60 years from now the ride ends, I'm gonna look back and go, I'm really glad I got on. SBA provides all kinds of services to veterans, military family members, and members of the Guard and Reserve who want to start and grow a business. Those include the training program, Boots to Business, but it also includes other training programs specifically for service-disabled veterans, women veterans, and military spouses. And business acumen doesn't come with just training. You also need some opportunities. Opportunities that can be introduced through federal contracting, where the government is going to spend 3% of the entire spend with service-disabled veterans. We can get 
get you ready for those opportunities as well. And finally, money. Everyone wants to know about what money is available for business. SBA.gov will tell you more about it. And veterans and service members and military spouses are eligible for fee relief on the loans that SBA guarantees. To learn more about Boots to Business and other SBA resources for veterans, visit sba.gov slash vets. Recently, we had a chance to sit down with Navajo code talker Thomas Begay at his childhood home in New Mexico. The Battle of Iwo Jima veterans spoke of his experiences joining the classified code talker program and the consequences of war. 1943, I was unemployed. I couldn't get a job. I told my mom I'm old enough. I'm 17. She used her thumbprint. That drives me to join the Marines. When I got there, I thought I was going to gunnery school. <laughs> here, I, but I walk in the barracks, there's a whole bunch of my boys. I didn't know none of them. I reported to Sergeant Donati. Sir, I said, I think I'm in the wrong place. I signed up to be aerial gunner school. I didn't sign up, he said, Coat Tucker School. It's a secret project, he said. Couldn't believe it. I said, I didn't sign up to be Coat Tucker, sir. I want to be aerial gunner, that's what I want to be. It's too bad, he said. You're refusing the order to be a Coat Tucker. If you run off, Desertion, doing the war, they were going to shoot you. Oh my gosh, what did I get? I thought I was going to the Marine, you know. I'll tell you what, he says, tomorrow I'm going to give you a 20 word code. Yeah, it was so easy, the language that I knew very well. So this is how it was, so I became a code talker. I was in battlefield six times. World War II, Battle of Iwo Jima, 0900, February 19, 1945. Combat, frontline, Ford Observer, radio operator. So I spent 38 days with radio section H&S Company, 27th Marine, 5th Marine Division. Then I came back in 1946, discharged, and came back here. I'm back from war. So that's how it was. Begay is one of 13 living Navajo code talkers. He celebrated his 93rd birthday this year and continues to serve his community. For more on Begay and veterans like him, visit blogs.va.gov. When we come back, one, two, three, go! veterans test their mettle against one another and themselves. We grew up together. We believed in something bigger than ourselves. The military took me to one side of the world and her to the other. And even though she was always the strong one, when we caught up years later, I found out she had fallen on some hard times. It was her call to make, but doing it together made all the difference. When I see homeless vets on my route, I always think to myself, we both swore an oath to protect our way of life, to protect our community. With VA's hotline for homeless vets, I can get them connected with help, help to get them back on their feet again. VA's round-the-clock hotline can put veterans who are homeless in touch with the resources and support they earned through their military service. You have the power to help a veteran facing homelessness. Go to va.gov homeless to print your wild cards. For veterans who are homeless or on the brink of homelessness, call 877-424-3838. Welcome back to the American Veteran. Every summer, nearly 600 veterans from across the country gather to compete in the National Veterans Wheelchair Games, co-presented by VA and the Paralyzed Veterans of America. Let's have a look. This is a life without limits. This is the National Veterans. 
veteran's wheelchair dead. It is time to take it to the next level. It's not about just competing here. You have got to go back to your own hamlets now and get engaged. You are now the inspiration team. In the name of all competitors, I promise that we will participate in these games respecting and adhering to the rules of the games in the true spirit of sportsmanship and friendship among our fellow service veterans for the glory of the spirit and the honor of self, team, and country. Go forth and inspire. The 38th Annual National Veterans Wheelchair Games will take place in Orlando in 2018. Registration opens January 1st. For more information on VA's Adapted Sports Program, visit va.gov slash adaptive sports. That's it for this edition of The American Veteran. We are honored to bring these stories to you. You can see everything we've shared with you today, as well as detailed information about veteran resources online. Please follow our social media channels and subscribe to our podcast, available in your app store. Thank you for watching our program. See you next time.